pages, or at least one more page extra, but we'll pick up from, from where we left off and I'll sum it up, I'll review very quickly, hopefully. Uh, I had a whiteboard in here last week and, and on the whiteboard, on the whiteboard, I had two, two columns. One was a Hebrew Eastern column and the other was a Greco-Roman Western common, column. And that I said that we live most of our lives here in the Western, the United States of America, we live our lives in, in a Western mindset. And it hinders us in many ways from understanding the word of the Lord because the, the word of the Lord is written in a Hebrew Eastern mindset. Now there's so many differ, differentiations. I'm going to... Okay, everybody hold on a second. You won't need these notes for the next few minutes. I'm, I'm, there's always going to be this tension, isn't there? You don't need these notes for the next few minutes. I'm going to sum up. For those that weren't here, I have to do this. So we had these columns on the whiteboard. There's differences between, the, the, we've pointed out the differences between the Hebrew Eastern mindset and the Greco Roman Western mindset. And we did them one by one on the whiteboard. One I didn't mention very simply was over here you have, in Hebrew, you have what is the year in Hebrew right now? What is the Hebrew year on the earth? It's 5776. And we know now, because we've talked about this a couple of weeks, that every one of those numbers not only has a numeric value, but it has a pictorial value. And so those numbers, 5776, have a meaning each year that describe some of the things, what the Lord is, he, he defines the year by the number. He defines what he's doing by numbers. And we do not, we never understood that because we were only taught phonetics in school and we won't, weren't taught pictorial along with phonetics because there's a whole alphabet and a whole language over in this column that is pictorial and the language that we've grown up with is only phonetic. So over here we have 2016, over here you have 5776. We, so we have creation on this side and we have evolution over on this side and evolution means order coming from chaos it is insane to think that order can come from chaos yet there's people who refuse to submit themselves in rebellion they try to prove that that order can come from chaos but even the earth as we watch today over the last five years three years ten years we keep seeing order come unraveled and turning into chaos that's the normal way that things happen it's just the way order unravels and turns into chaos without the restraining hand of the Lord so it's exactly yeah, you got people that'll, that'll laugh at you if, you if you say that if you talk about creation oh, so you have that over on this on in this side we have tribes we have a tribal that represents togetherness. We have the tribes of Israel and that represents a type of togetherness that over here in our culture we have individualism and we have um, independence. We love our independence. United States of America, we're independent. We're individuals, rugged individuals and that's, an, that's exactly opposite of a kingdom mentality of a tribal, cu tribal culture of being together. We, we lose that in our culture. So we talked about the kingdom. And the, I said that you over here we have the kingdom of God. And here in the word of, we have the kingdom. But over here we have democracy. And we have republic. And we have people that will fight for democracy and republic. And I don't say that you shouldn't. But n not to the exclusion of the reality of the kingdom. All these things are less than the kingdom. The kingdom is greater than. And you have seven mountains. We talked about it. Government. Education, business, religion, media, family, economy, the entertainment, and the arts. All of these things have kingdom application. But in our Greco-Roman mindset, we have grown up with an idea that all of these things are governed the way we think governs with presidents. And all these things are different than the kingdom government. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. You go right on down the line. You go over every one of these mountains of the Lord have kingdom application, but we in our Greco-Roman mindset have been encapsulated with an understanding that is not biblical. It's contrary to the word of God. It's contrary to the ways of God. So we have loyalty and devotion. If you have a kingdom, you have to have a king. So we in the kingdom, there has to be loyalty and devotion to Jesus. Over here in this category, that we, the society in which we live today, there's loyalty and devotion to everything but Jesus. I mean anything. And there's mixture in the church. There's nationalism, loyalty and devotion to a nation above loyalty to Jesus. And people align ourselves. There's loyalty in the church. There's loyalty and devotion to a denomination. 
more than there's loyalty to Jesus. We've grown, so many of us have grown up in this. Maybe we've got a little bit of it still going on here now with us. There's loyalty to movements within the church, good movements. We mentioned them. Abortion, what a great movement. Thank God for the, the, the pro-life movement within the church, but not greater than just our loyalty to Jesus. And we listed them. Adoption, human trafficking, racism, poverty, inequality, prayer movement, the missions movement. The missions movement will tell you if you're not planting churches, you have to ask yourself if you're really a church at all. That's what the missions movement, that's their drum they're going to pound. And, and they can't really see that they're just, their missions movement is just one slice of the bigger pie of the kingdom. And the King Jesus, the loyalty first and all, together, all together, the loyalty must be to Jesus. Well, thank you for whoever it was that actually said it. Thank you. The teacher, the one who knows I'm wrestling up here. So you have all these causes within the church. Uh, you have all these causes, period. You have political parties, and people are, are loyal, more loyal to their political party than they are to Jesus. And you could be loyal to a political party, but not more than you're loyal to Jesus, because there's a whole kingdom, and there won't be political parties when Jesus comes and sets his kingdom up on the earth. Okay, we talked about that. And then we, we brought it all down to one thing, covenant. The difference, this is the one that we have to figure out the differences, because our whole society has been governed by what? Not covenant, but... Contracts. Contracts. A signed document that holds you accountable. But a covenant is based on God's word. This column over here, the Hebrew column, this is the originator of covenant. There was no covenant outside of this Hebrew, Western, or Eastern kingdom concept. There's no covenant. Covenant is only and exclusively over in this category. Which is why we're seeing even the, the marriage covenant, the one thing out of the kingdom cu culture that we brought over into our Western culture, even that has been disintegrating more. So we just had our, last Monday we enjoyed our 40th anniversary. And I can tell you for sure, if we hadn't given our lives, to fa difficulties, uh, failures, yes, but if we had not given our lives to this category, the Hebrew kingdom Jesus category, there's no way that we'd be standing here saying, wow, 40 years later, it's just, who, who would have thought here we'd be 40 years later? And nonetheless, here we are, thank God, if, if it wasn't for Jesus, it, we, it wouldn't be happening. But covenants are based on your word, but not only that, it's crept into the church, because testament, a testament a testament is really a Greco-Roman word. And I went into all the details about the New Testament creating this issue where in your mind that the idea of a New Testament would make you think that then the Old Testament is old and irrelevant anymore. And that's wrong. It's a wrong concept. It creates a wrong idea. It's the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. There's no new. There's no old. It should just be renewed. And so we have to... I went into all these things in detail and I'm, I'm just reviewing, okay? And I'm... I'm done reviewing, but even Testament, you see, comes, it's a Bible. It's, I, we spent our whole lives, our whole adult lives, reading Old Testament, New Testament. Now see, even our Bible translations, almost all of them are, have been written in this Greco-Roman mindset. Even the Bible translations. When I was a young man, uh, studying the Word of God, it, it, every, everybody, it was the most popular thing to do was learn Greek. And I can tell you for sure, if I could learn one language on the, on the earth, it would be Hebrew. Because I'm, I'm learning more truth from learn, understanding the Hebrew than I'm ever going to learn from the Greek. That doesn't mean that... Learn, heck, I had to learn Spanish. It was wonderful to have to learn Spanish. I had to learn how to live. We had to learn how to live in Russia. So it was great to learn enough Russian to be able to exist. But th these languages are not eternal. God created a race of people and he created the Hebrew race and Jesus is a Hebrew man who's coming back to rule the world. <laughs> a Jewish man. This is going to be offensive to so many. Oh, oh. Did you see in the Olympics? Did you see in the Olympics where the guy from Egypt, the wrestler from Egypt was wrestling the guy from Israel and he, there's a picture. He, the Israeli guy reaches out to shake his hand and the Egyptian guy just looks away. He won't even shake his hand. He's a Muslim, you know, the short hair and the long beard. He's a Muslim. So, so you, you got to just prove, you know, prove it on the mat. So you, the Israel guy did the only thing to do. He whooped him. <laughs> just prove, prove it on the mat, you know, prove it on the mat. 
All right. So dimensions and depths of covenant, we're continuing. That was a little review. On the first page of your notes, we, we've gone through this already. I'll just say that the, um, I'll just read Exodus 24-7. It's the book of covenant. Now you understand everything in the Bible, it's, a, it's about God explaining his covenant. It's the central theme. When Jesus came on the earth, it was to restore God's covenant back again to the place where it was with Adam and Eve in the garden. To restore in other words, there was, it was set up perfectly in the Garden of Eden at one point where God actually walked with man. In the cool of the day, it says, they would walk together. Wow, let's get back to that again. I mean, where his feet are on the earth. Well, God did walk with man for a season on the earth from the, when Jesus walked on this earth. But he's coming back literally to bring his kingdom to the earth. And it's all not restored yet. Has the kingdom come? Yes. Is the kingdom still coming? Yes. Is it one or the other? No. It's both. It's both. His kingdom came, but his kingdom is coming. Some people, it's a paradox, and some people, it's hard for them to grasp. All right. He took the book of the covenant, and he read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do, and we will be obedient. That's the key. We will do, and we will be obedient. So we went through these notes. We talked about the blood covenant being a relationship of servanthood. We got all through that. And let me just sum up blood covenant so we can get right to covenant of salt. Blood covenant is the entry point into servanthood. I want to say it again because we were taught for years that blood covenant was the beginning and the end. But really, blood covenant was just the first step in God restoring his covenant on the earth as, as we'll see. Ultimately, Jesus said his blood, but there were other dimensions of covenant that actually signified other dynamics of the kingdom that God wants us to walk in. So the blood covenant, this is where Christians get it. They get saved. They, 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 they say some prayer and they get saved or they have an experience and they get saved and they think, it's it, I'm done. That's just the entry point, people. Salvation, the, your salvation experience is just that. It's no less, no more. It's just the entry point into the kingdom. You're seeing the kingdom for the first time when you get saved. You haven't entered in. You're just seeing it now for the first time. You see that there is a doorway to enter in. That's all you're seeing. And this is confusing. I mean, there's believers all over the earth, but really in the United States of America, who are filling churches today and think, I'm saved, and that's all there is to it. Hallelujah, I'm happy. And they're going to make their claims, and their claims aren't going to get them anywhere because they didn't do the first step, which was servanthood. The blood covenant is an entry point into servanthood. Now, the, some of us learned all that by default because we immediately started serving. So we started serving other people, just however we could. We moved to Florida. I've been, in, I've been a worship leader for eight years. I moved to Florida a long time ago, and nobody knew that was really hot worship leader. Nobody knew that at all. I was just another guy. So where do we go to work? Where do we go to work? We went to work in the benevolence ministry of a megachurch. And every Wednesday evening, we would unload a tractor trailer full of clothes with a group of people. And we would sort through all those clothes every sinking Wednesday. Do you know how hot it is in Orlando, Florida on a, on a 6 o'clock on a Wednesday night to unload a tractor trailer full of clothes? I'm thinking, mm -mm. they know me. They, they got to know me. This ain't, <laughs> this ain't for me. No. No, but we did it. We really did. You just get, serve, serve something. Serve, serve somehow. Just serve somehow. That's what gains you the Lord's access to move you to the another level, other levels of covenant. Well, some Christians, they get saved and they think this is it. It's, it's about me. I mean, this is all Jesus did this for me. <laughs> People, this is about Jesus over here in this category. This is our Greco-Roman mindset thinking. It's about us. This is this category. You see what I mean? I'm still the whiteboard. Some people never get past Christians, people that are going to be in heaven for all of eternity. They don't get past this idea that it's really not about them. It's about a king and a kingdom. Yeah, right. 
Because, and so they don't start serving. They don't start serving other people. And they never get to these other levels of covenant. Now, some of you, you, didn't, you might not have understood all this. Maybe you don't even understand it now. But you started serving, and the Lord would reveal himself to you in other ways based on the fact that you're actually doing what it was that he said to do in the first covenant. Serve and obey. Serve others and obey. It's what he told Adam in the garden. Till the garden. Cultivate the garden. It wasn't just sit around and have people wait on your hand and foot. He said, increase the garden all over the planet. You have a job to do. Hey, it was a good deal. So Adam said, okay, let's, I'm on this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to obey. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to work. I'm going to cultivate. I'm not just going to lay back and expect that everybody's going to, Eve's going to serve me. No, it wasn't any of that. It's, but, of course, we got derailed along the way. But he started by serving, serving the Lord. And that is the entry point into the, the next many levels of covenant. Servanthood. We said that last week. What did Jesus say? Whoever wants to be great among you shall be your servant. servant. He said that in Matthew 20, 26. It's not in your notes, but you all know it. If you want to be great, learn to be the servant of all. It's still true today, people, even though our, everything in our culture pushes against it. This culture, the one that, that covers our mindset. So a covenant of salt. Now this is a relationship of friendship and hospitality. We went through one of the scriptures, uh, 2 Chronicles 13.5. Do you not know, you should underline this one in your notes, that the Lord God of Israel gave the rule over Israel forever to David and his sons by a covenant of salt. Now just because the word rule is in there, I want to know a little bit more about this covenant of salt because that's what I'm about. I'm about I want to rule and reign with Jesus because it said that one day we are going to rule and reign with him on the earth. We're going to be seated at his right hand, ruling and reigning over the whole earth with him. So you, you can read the scriptures, uh, the other scriptures here. With all your offerings, you'll offer salt. Uh, in the Numbers 18 scripture, it's an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord. Okay, so you can read those on your own. So there are just a few mentions of the covenant of salt. But let's get to Abraham, who was called the friend of God. I'm going to read James. Some of you would, I'm reading, you're looking at James, you write in the middle of your notes, page two. Someone may well say you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Let's just substitute the word works for service, serving. I'll show you my faith by my serving. You know, you can tell the measure of somebody's faith by their ability, their willingness to serve. You can tell what? You can tell the measure of their faith by their willingness to serve. Because I'll show you my faith by my works, or by my serving. You believe that God is one, you do well. Faith without works is useless. Abraham, let's look at verse 23. The scripture is fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accorded to him or reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man isn't justified by works, is justified by works and not by faith alone. This, or you could say, a man is justified by serving and not by faith alone. By serving, by cultivating Works, that's all the same word. I'm just paraphrasing. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out. So it says here that Abraham was called the friend of God. Well, where in the Bible was Abraham called a friend of God? I can just tell you. It, it's not there. I can just tell you. I don't know how, much, how well you know the word of God. I'd say some of you pretty well. I'd say some of you, not, not as much, but let's, get, let's just get in the Word. But I can just tell you, 99.9% .9 certainty, it's not there. So in other words, James, had, he wrote this. By the way, James, here's, a, here's our Greco-Roman world for it. Perfect example of our Greco-Roman world. The book of James was changed by who? By King James, because that's the 1600 Bible, King James Bible, the one that was around when I was a new Christian with all the these and thous. He just decided, well, I want one of the guys in the Bible over here to have my name. So he took the, the word Jacob, that Jacob actually wrote that book, Jacob. I'm not going to change the culture of America by starting to call that book Jacob. You can do it if you want to. I'm not going to, because it's the truth. It is the truth, but I'm not going to... I swim upstream on so many issues that this is not going to be the hill I die on. 
Just so you know. So I'm going to call it James because everybody's going to know what I'm talking about. But it isn't James. It's Jacob. And we wouldn't even know that. We here in our Greco-Roman world, if somebody hadn't brought that to our attention, we would not even know that. And it wouldn't matter one bit to us. But it should matter because people are twisting even the Word of God. Words like James instead of Jacob. Words like New Covenant instead of Renewed Covenant. It makes a difference because New Covenant caused all these people to... Tens of thousands of churches, they don't pay any attention to, from, to Genesis to Malachi. They think it's irrelevant today. Nothing, nothing, nothing could be more egregious and erroneous. Nothing. Oh, help us, Jesus. I remember as a young believer, a very well-known Bible teacher who was on hundreds, thousands of radio stations in the United States. He would just get on there every day at 10 a.m. and he would say, I'm just a well-known guy. And he would say, you should just focus mainly on the four Gospels and the Epistles. That's all you really need to know. Oh, I'm, it saddens me to this day to think about that. You would know his name. And I, I, love, I love his ministry. He had a great revelation, tremendous healing ministry, tremendous, tremendous testimony. But, but, but it was so misleading to say, just read the Gospels and the Epistles, and that, you don't need to read all that other stuff. Oh, oh, every word of God is profitable. But I, I, I'm still going to hug his neck and thank him when I see him. I, he's, the, he's in heaven. I, I hope I get a chance to talk about that. He, he's laughing about it by now, I hope. Thank you, at least. So, well, I just read from the book of Jacob. No. I did read from the book of Jacob, just so you know. I'm going on record. All right. Now, this is important. There's an account of Abraham where he broke bread with Jesus, the Lord appeared to him. Let's read that. And they broke bread together with, as friends. And bread is made from salt. You can't make bread without salt. Just so you know, there's salt in that covenant that makes bread. And breaking bread together, there's a very... Spiritual dynamic. Now, we, everybody does this, but I can tell you, if you will sit down with a meal, at a meal with someone, you will break into a whole different realm of, of, of friendship with them. Just once. Just once. You will, the, your hearts will be so much more intertwined if you sit down over a meal with somebody. It's a spiritual dynamic. This is why in Acts 2.42, it said they were continually devoting themselves together to just four things. They were devoting themselves to four things. Do you remember Acts 2.42? Do you remember what they are? Let's say it together. Apostolic teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. You, you remember that. I know you do. Acts 2.42. You have to know that. You have to know that by memory. Not just... You know, I mean that. You do. You need to know that by memory. Acts 2.42. They were continually devoting themselves to these four things. Not just any teaching. Apostolic teaching. And God help me, there's a difference. Apostolic teaching. Teaching with apostolic grace and anointing on it. Without that, the teaching anointing is not going to be nearly as effective. It's good, thank God for it, but there, the apostolic prophetic covering has to be over all the teaching. It has to, because they're the foundational gifts. In Ephesians, it's for another day. Okay, so those four things, apostolic teaching, b fellowship, connecting together, besides just going to a meeting, looking in the back of somebody's head. I said last week, even the way we arrange these chairs and rows, it's, it's, it's the Greco-Roman way. We did it in school. It was the wrong way. It's wrong. That's not the way they do it in, in, in the Hebrew culture. It, in, in the age to come, it won't be like this either. I'm telling you. Just, you can believe me or not. You can wrestle with it. That's just my view, but I think, that I'm, I think I have the mind of the Lord. But we are so ingrained. There was a time in worldview where we got rid of all these chairs and rows years ago where we, were, we had a building. We weren't using somebody else's building where we'd have to rearrange these chairs every single day. But we changed them and we set it up very differently where you were with groups of people, groups of people, groups of four, five, six, around tables and chairs and couches. But not, not just this. This is so linear. We said that Hebrew thinking was what? Cyclical, cyclical, cyclical. It always comes around, always comes around. Even though I'm saying it, it's still hard to grasp. But we know that Greco-Roman thinking is linear. Linear. We're all on a journey. We have to understand these things. They're all different. We are so engrossed in this. We spend 98% of our time over in this culture. And we wonder why we don't have a breakthrough. Because we don't understand the Word of God the same way. 
There's understanding locked in the, in, in the whole Genesis to Malachi. And we have to understand the Hebrew language for a greater revelation. All right. Genesis 18, 1. You're there at the bottom of page 2. The Lord appeared to Abraham. Three men were standing opposite him. He ran and he bowed himself. So the Lord appeared as a man with two others. They were angel. It might have been Gabriel and Michael. I don't know. It doesn't say. But, but I do know the two angels at least are identified in the word of God. Good chance it was these three. How would you like it? You'd be hanging over at the house and Jesus shows up. Incarnate Jesus shows up with two angels. Yes, please. I mean, I hope he doesn't catch me doing something wrong. And, you know, I'm just hoping I'm just hanging out. Okay, so here's the thing. Verse 3 says, My Lord, now if I found favor in your sight. He knows who he is. Because he says, I found favor in your sight. Don't pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought to wash your feet. Rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may go on since you visited your servant. And they said, they said, do as you have said. Well, let me tell you something. Just, I'm in the middle of the desert somewhere. And I'm visiting somebody. And they say, hey, let me go get a little piece of bread. That does not sound all that hospitable to me. <laughs> How about you? No, no, there's a great, great deal more meaning in that culture at that time. It just meant we're going to have a meal together. We're going to have bread. And he was just saying bread, but it was going to be a whole meal because if you go ahead and read it all, he said quickly, go prepare, um, um, go prepare, uh, he quickly prepared three measures of fine flour, knead it and make bread cakes. And of course they had a lamb, uh, they had a goat that they prepared or a lamb or something. I don't remember exactly, but they prepared an animal. All this took a little bit of time. But let me tell you this. It, was, it had to have been unleavened bread because you can't make bread quickly because it would have had leaven in it and it has to rise. You have people that bake, you know, it takes time for it to rise. Um, but, but this is signifying they're, they're, making, they're presenting something to him that's a sinless offering of the unleavened bread. It's sinless. And so that, that's, that's acceptable. So this is an issue of kingdom hospitality, which is a gift, and kingdom fellowship over bre breaking bread. This is the first, re record, rec the first record of the Lord after the garden, the fall in the garden. He's restoring now, actually face to face with Abraham as a friend. And this is where James can say, Jacob, can say, well, he was called the friend of God because it's not in the word of God. It's not in the word of God that he was ever called the friend of God. But, of course, it was all handed down generation by generation. He was called the friend of God because nobody else actually sat down with him and ate with him face to face and had a meal together. And because of that friendship, of course, uh, we're not going to go into that end of the story right now, but because of that friendship being restored, this is key here. Please get this. Please get what I'm about to say. Because that friendship level of, of covenant was restored with Abraham at that point, then the Lord brought him in. Should I tell them what I'm about to do over in Sodom and Gomorrah? Should I tell him? It wouldn't have happened without this friendship level of covenant. Because now you're a friend of God. And I'm going to tell you something. When you get to the place where you, God reveals himself. If you serve God and be obedient to him. And he begins. There are people. There are people. Many people. Many people. Who, who, who don't feel as if God is really like the friend. He's never revealed himself. There's no amount of me telling you he's your friend that's going to have you. You can't get it by me telling you he wants to be your friend. You can only earn it. You can't earn salvation. Free gift. But everything else, you'll earn your way to the next level. He will acknowledge your, your ability to serve. You acknowledge your, your struggle to be obedient to him. And he will make himself a friend to you. And friends reveal their hearts. So now to Abraham, he said, should we, should we not? But yes, we're going to. This is, friend, I'm going to tell you what's about to happen on the earth. It's a, that's, a, that's, that's an act of the heart between friends. Do you understand? God of the universe is now speaking his heart to his friend. Oh, that every one of us would walk in this level of covenant before him. Please understand what I'm talking about. I, I'm very serious now. Lord would love nothing more than to reveal his heart to you as a friend. But I'll tell you what, if he does, he'll tell you stuff that'll make you cry. 
He, he, because it hurt. It's his heart too. Now we all want to hear the good stuff. I, I want to hear the good stuff too. But when the Lord says, I want to share something with you, my friend, you, you better be expecting him to share some of the things on his heart that grieve him. Because he will. That's, that's part of being a friend. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. That I may know him. And I'm like, you know, young whippersnapper. Oh, yeah. I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I just say it over. I think into my heart, Lord, I want to know the power of your resurrection. I want the power. And he would say, well, you, you, you never even know the power of the resurrection until you can know the fellowship of my suffering. I'm like, well, whatever, you know, whatever. Flippantly, casually, until you really, until you, he tells you something. That's he's fellowshipping with you what's on his heart, the suffering of his heart. People, there are times when I hear people talk about these kind of things and I know instantly, I can tell that they have gone somewhere with the Lord that I haven't gone. I know it. Because I haven't experienced what it is they're describing. But he wants you to experience it. Us. So that's what he was doing with Abraham. Invitation into deeper dimensions of friendship, a covenant, are granted by God as reward of servanthood and obedience. Most born-again people never experience the Lord's appearing to them as a friend. All right, I've said that. Because they haven't reciprocated correctly the first step of covenant by serving. I'm repeating this pretty much, but thank you for acknowledging that. John chapter 3, I gave the scripture to you last week. And my, my African friends told me this, and I, for years I didn't know what they were talking about, but it says the same thing I've been telling you over and over again. So now I'm, I'm connecting it to covenant. You should be able to walk away with a, some level of understanding. He said, and truly one must be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. You must be born again to see the kingdom of God. But then he describes a whole different relationship. A whole different experience. And he said, you've got to be born of water and born of the Spirit or else you cannot enter into. So you have the salvation. You can Suddenly you can see with salvation. You can see that Jesus is real. You can see the King. You can see the kingdom. But you spend the whole rest of your life figuring out what does it mean, born of water and the Spirit, in order to enter into the covenant of the kingdom. So there are many, 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 the overwhelming majority who are born again people who can see now the kingdom of God, but they do not and have not entered in because of all the things that we, we we're talking about right now. Do you, get, do you get the idea whether you could, do you get what I'm trying to say? Because we're all on a journey together. Far deeper requirement to actually enter into the kingdom. And I tell you people, people can go to church, people can pray, people can tithe, but most of them wouldn't be because they don't understand it all belongs to him anyway. People that don't tithe don't understand just that very basic principle. They don't understand it all belongs to him anyway. And so you, you won't, if, you, if you're not a tither, if you're not a tither, I mean, a, just and a giver, I mean tithes and offerings, if you don't just take that bare minimum, there's dimensions of Jesus you'll never walk in. I, I can tell you for sure. Dimensions of Jesus you will never walk in. It's a test of your heart. And, and he won't reveal himself if you can't pass Christianity first grade. And there's people who struggle with it. Grown-ups. And people who think they're spiritual that struggle with it. And I'm, not, I'm not saying anything. It's the Lord. He's saying it. I'm not saying it. It's what it is. So God wants to restore the lost friendship and closeness of this type of relationship offers. When we enter into the salt covenant, he expands on the servanthood covenant. Blood covenant rewards us with more of himself. When Abraham welcomed the Lord and broke bread with him, he was wel his welcoming hospitality demonstrated the salt covenant. Breaking bread was the salt covenant. There's salt in the bread. It's with the blood covenant. The salt covenant begins at God's initiation. Here's the thing you have to understand. If you don't pass grade one, God will not initiate the invitation into second grade. So he, is, he gave, with the blood covenant, he initiated the covenant with you. He revealed himself to you that you could see him. You could see, in, you could see the kingdom. 
And now if you respond appropriately, he'll reveal himself to you in a greater measure, the next level. And that is, he'll, you, he'll welcome you into the place of friendship where you can learn how to be hospitable and learn to open yourself up, open your life up, open your home up. That's what he did. He opened himself up by opening his life up. What Abraham did. And he will in turn open him, Jesus will open himself up to you to another level. All right. Commentators say that in ancient Middle Eastern culture, salt was a precious commodity that was used every day for eating. And it, but it was a precious commodity, not like today. And when men entered into a covenant, they each carried a bag of salt and they would mix the two bags together and divide them up. Therefore, you know, your salt is now all in my bag and my salt is all in your bag and it's all salt and it was inseparable. And that was now a level of covenant that was, we were now inseparable. You and I were inseparable. This was a level of covenant beyond just being, waving at your neighbor when you're heading to your car. So they use this Arabic phrase. This is what commentators say. I, I don't read this in the Bible, but this is what the commentators say. Uh, Middle Eastern history. So that's all I'm saying about that. I, I don't like when people preach history as, as the word of God. So I'm just differentiating between the two. But this is again, this is over here in this culture. This Hebrew culture, we, this Eastern culture that we don't know very much about. So they say that when they would do this act together, they would say there is salt between us or he has eaten of my salt. And of course, you read it in your notes, salt is a preservative and is symbolic of an enduring covenant. It's foreshadowing the two becoming one flesh in a marriage covenant. Mixing that salt together in that bag was a foreshadowing, a foreshadowing of a higher level of covenant that we'll get to because we're talking about covenant on the whiteboard. I'm pointing to the whiteboard. We're, we're, going to, we're speaking, all this is about covenant, levels of covenant. And the difference is between a covenant and a contract. Because our society is governed by contracts. You sign your name on a piece of paper. And then they'll come after you if you don't do what it is that the paper says you have to do. But God's word is his covenant. And I want to be around people who give me their word and then they do it. I don't want to, I, 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 I struggle with people that, I struggle when I give someone my word and then I don't follow up on it. How about you? Let's be people of this category, the word, the covenant. Let's walk as covenant people now. We can do this now. Your word is your body. Don't, you, don't say the word if you can't back it up. Don't just tell me something and then don't do it. Let's be covenant people. Better off not to have said it at all than make a vow before God and then he holds you to the vow. So, do you see the scriptures about you're the salt of the earth? We've read that. Salt is good. But how are you going to make it salty again? You can read those on your own. We know those scriptures. Since it, This is a, a rabbi. You see the, down here at the bottom of page 3. Um, since the throne of Israel was established by a salt covenant, and since we are the sons and daughters of that Davidic kingdom, Yeshua is saying to us today that you are the salt of the earth. We are God's covenant of salt on the earth. In other words, we're the ones that are going to open our homes and be hospitable across the table. We're the ones that are going to offer the friendship. We're the ones that are going to actually be the salt that causes the covenant to blend together. And most of us, we don't want to blend salt with the world. We're like, oh, no, no, they might, their salt might be a little dirty. It's hard. It's hard to rightly divide, right? No, it takes discernment. We do need to be the salt of the earth, but to whom, to whom are we going to be the salt? Anyway, that's what this Israel, that's what this rabbi said. You are the children of Israel. We are the salt. We are now the salt covenant. All right. Serving others in obedience. Now here, here, let's take about the friendship. We're going to go to the next level, sandal covenant. Serving others in obedience is the entry point into the Lord's friendship. Okay, so that's the entry point. Now, the sandal covenant is about inheritance. We're going to get through this. Sandal covenant is about inheritance. Uh, there's a, even, even in Western, like the great uh, land rush in the Wild West, we had a, we had a version of this. Like um, they, would, they would ride off and they would put a stake in the ground and that would be their claim. This is my land. I put a stake in the ground. Now, in, 
The historians say the Hebrews used worn out sandals to mark the boundaries of their property. The sandal covenant is about inheritance. Now there are people, all kinds of Christians out there all over the place that are claiming their inheritance that need to just go back and figure out how to do the blood covenant. Their end of the bargain of the blood covenant. Because they just learn how to, should just be learning how to serve, should just be learning how to be obedient in the little things because they're out here claiming their inheritance which is never going to come because you haven't been invited into this level of covenant yet by the Lord. Because you've got to get this first step one and step two before step three. Oh no, you've got to be his friend. You've got to be obedient servant. You've got to serve others. You've got to do all that stuff before God's ever going to give you an inheritance on this earth. I mean a spiritual inheritance on the earth. This whole issue about you be faithful in a little thing and I'll give you ten cities. That's this inheritance right here, the Sandal Covenant. All right. Deuteronomy 19.14, and this is one that America is going to have to reckon with at some point. You shall not move your neighbor's boundary mark which your ancestors have set. And when we came into this land that everybody, yes, was founded on the word of God, whose boundary markers got moved? Native Say it real loud. Native Americans. There's just a few of you saying that. How about the others? How about the rest of you? Thank you. Yes. And these boundary markers were removed. And people, this is unsettled business in, on our earth. This is unsettled business in our nation. I don't even know. I, I know this. I, I've had some people do some wrong things to me and then just come along later on and say, I'm sorry, but that did not fix it. I don't, I, I'd like to say that they fixed it just by saying I'm sorry, but it didn't because I'm left now with the consequences. I'm left now with the consequences of them doing me wrong. And it's cost me a great deal. And so them just come along and saying, you know, back five years ago when this happened, I'm really sorry that happened. But dude, that set both of our lives on a different trajectory. And so you saying sorry, great, thank you. You should have said sorry. I accept your apology, but it's still not done. It's not finished. It's not fixed. And so this whole thing, I can, I can think a little bit now about all the injustice done to uh, slaves and all these other issues, injustice done to human beings, um, poverty and all this other thing. I can really, I'm grasping this now because somebody has done something to all of us. And them just coming along and saying, if, if you have lived in a horrible covenant relationship with someone and they hurt you, 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 and they just come along and one day say, I'm sorry about it. Well, yeah, okay, great. This is your starting point now. You're sorry. Make it up to me. And I'll let you know when you've made it up to me. Well, that happened in our marriage at the 20-year mark. I finally came to my senses. <laughs> And I really, I had a, revel a word from the Lord, revelation from God in counseling. It wasn't a psychological thing. It was a word from the Lord, but it changed everything in one minute. Like, so I know a word can. So I went to Mary and I said, the next 20 years are going to make up for the first 20. So now here we are last week. Last week, we're 40 years into we're the 20 more. I can't believe it. The next 20 years have, have gone on, have happened. So I'm going to ask her. Don't take what, what I say doesn't have any, it's what she has to say about it. You see? Oh, by the way, I was in ministry, you know, pretty much the whole time, just so you know. And I still needed to make up the next 20 years to her. Just so you know. But you'd have to, you could just ask her, well, how'd the next 20 years go? All right. So the Sandal Covenant. It's about inheritance. Inheritance requires the responsibility of stewardship. And God will not give you responsibility of stewardship until you prove faithful in these other areas of covenant. All right. Stewardship is huge to the Lord. Stewardship. I would love nothing more than to talk about eight weeks on stewardship. I really would. I, it's a big deal to me. A really big deal. Stewardship of your body. Stewardship of your resources. Your time. Your health, stewardship of all of these things. There's so many different things that we are we are supposed to be and required by God to be good stewards. And it's a growing. You know, we have to be aware by the Word of God. He reveals it to us. But it's a growing. It takes us. We grow in these things. Our authority of stewards on the earth 
Our inheritance is promised in Revelation 20 when the bride sits with Jesus on the throne and we will reign with him. Verses 4 and verses 6, Revelation 20. You can read it on your own. All right, we're going to talk, touch briefly on the Kingsman Redeemer. The Kinsman Redeemer. That's close relative. We know the story of Ruth. Now this was the custom, Ruth 4, 7. This was a custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption of the exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another. Are you reading that? A man removed his sandal and gave it to another. And this was the manner of attestation in Israel. So in other words, not only did Boaz, the kingdom redeemer, he didn't just buy a piece of land. He bought the piece of land in order to acquire or redeem a person, Ruth, that you know the story. So not only is this inheritance about redeeming land, but my African friends have taught us for years, whoever controls the land controls the behavior of the people on the land. So in other words, the, the land, if, if the land is filled with demonic and dark forces, the people are going to act the way the land, the land itself, the land itself needs to be redeemed. We're no longer redemption. We're no longer talking just about people. And we're talking about the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel, this category, remember I do this, I mean I'm over in the Hebrew category. Everybody knows, right? <laughs> The nation of Israel literally will be redeemed one day. And it won't just be the geographical borders that we're looking at right now. It will be the ones laid out in the, in the Word of God. You see, it will be the ones laid out in Torah. That will be the geographical boundary. But it's not only because we're all grafted in. It's going to be my glory will be seen in the whole earth. And so hey, my, 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 our responsibility for now is St. Louis, Missouri and the region. And so I'm going to be faithful here. But it's not just the people in the land that need redemption. It is the land itself that needs redemption. And I, I bring redemption to the land by the fact that my feet are walking on it. And that's just the beginning. It takes, it takes you've got to take territory. We've read it. We've read it. You've got to take back territory. There are, op there's opposition. What were we, we were singing this morning. Let God arise, his enemies be scattered. That's really real for today. So here, Boaz, he does this transfer where the guy says, you know, I can't have the property. You take the property. Here's my sandal. This is the sandal that actually is the territory marker for that property. And in buying that piece of land, you're actually given an inheritance of actually acquiring people. And wouldn't it be exciting if we would really understand and understand this covenant of inheritance where it's not about land, but it's about land and people. So we think of salvation, we think of salvation as we're just trying to get people saved. And by all means, let's do that. Let's, let's more lost people, backslidden people, let them return as prodigals to Jesus. But people, we, if we would understand this issue of land covenant, the inheritance, like this sandal covenant, this is all a progressive thing now. This is the third level of covenant. If we would start understanding more, more clearly what this inheritance covenant of sandal covenant is really all about, then we would acquire the people on the land as our inheritance as well. This is how you see that with Ruth and Boaz. All right. You can look at the rest of it. Moses understood the symbolism when he was commanded by God speaking from the burning bush to remove his sandals. It was, Moses, your man-made inheritance, you are surrendering that right now. Your man-made inheritance, you're giving up your right to whatever it is you possess right now. Now, see people, some people do this at salvation. They don't just ask Jesus into their heart and then squeeze him into their daytimer, you know, squeeze him into their uh, Evernote, you know, put him on a calendar. I'm going to pencil you in every morning at 7 a.m. for 15 minutes and then go on about my day. No, they're saying, here's my calendar, Lord. Here's my life. Fill it however you want. And if you come to Jesus that way, he will change your calendar. He will take your calendar. And that will, your inheritance will shift based on the way that you came to him. But there's too many people out there that just think they have, a, they have a experience, uh, an emotional experience. It's like they just go keep living. Uh, they, they keep their calendar. They keep their stuff. They keep their possessions. But there is a time where you are going to have to come to Jesus. Well, Jesus did it with the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler says, I followed all the commandments 
And Jesus said, that is impressive. I will say that. I already know that about you. Now, just go get rid of all your stuff and come in and follow me. You are invited now into a much closer relationship with me. Give up your earthly inheritance and I will bring you into a spiritual encounter of inheritance you will never, ever believe. That was Jesus' invitation to the rich young ruler. And many people hear the invitation, but they do not enter in because their stuff binds them to this earth. If you have never had this happen to you, this invitation to give up something of great value, not give up the old beat up car that doesn't run anymore, that's giving you fits. I'm talking about give up something, a possession of great value. Piece of land, piece of property. I don't know what it is in your heart, but you do. If that has not happened to you, then you not, have not yet had this invitation into this inheritance we're talking about. And that is a line you will have to draw. That is, ask, if you can ask God for the invitation, but it will, you'll give up something of this earth. Moses knew that. So when he took his sandals off, he was saying, okay, everything now is yours. I walk away from this in covenant with you at a level. Of, I've seen this bush. I walk away from this experience at a level. I have emptied everything to you. And, and I trust and believe that you will now give me an inheritance. Well, he did. He gave him all of Israel as an inheritance. He gave him the land. and he, he didn't get in there, but he gave him the promise of the inheritance. The people, the people and the land. You see, that's what Moses got by taking off his sandals. This is the sandal covenant. I hope you can begin to see these things in a different light. Because we're going next, not today, we're going next to betrothal and, and of course into marriage. I mean, this is all covenant stuff. It's good stuff. Uh, give us understanding, Lord. Give us understanding. I think we'll just end right there. Hi, what do you think? Is that pretty good? Okay, so let's just pray for just a moment. Just, just, just a moment. Lord, Lord God, give us understanding of these levels of covenant. Would you, would you, drop, would you drop into our hearts uh, the, the true meaning of these things that we've just talked about, just touched on today? And give us greater understanding of the levels of covenant that we are invited to. Whatever level we're at right now, we're saying, God, we are, speak for our, your servants is listening. And, and we, we want to hear the invitation or remind us that in the past you've been given us an invitation. Uh, and if we didn't respond appropriately, that we can now turn back and respond appropriately. There's the blood covenant where we respond, where we respond with servanthood. And then there's salt covenant where we, respond, where we respond with friendship and hospitality. And then there's the sandal covenant where we respond by giving, up, giving everything to you, all of our possessions. We're letting go of possessions, stuff. Letting go of our earthly inheritance because we want, Lord, a spiritual inheritance. You speak to all of us however you can in a way that we know that you can by faith. Give us hope in our hearts and vision in our hearts to be able to see that when you invite us into these deeper levels of covenant that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it even entered into the heart of man all those things you have in store for us. Get husbands and wives together, Lord, and speak to them together in covenant together. This is the invitation. What must we do to be invited into the deeper level of covenant? Individuals, same way. Let's all get our hearts in one accord and say, respond with a yes in our heart as the Lord leads us and we don't turn away like the rich young ruler and say, no, my possessions are too great. I just can't do it. Thank you, Lord. Let these things sink into our hearts. We're, we're, we're brought together for such a time as this right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Would you reveal yourself to us in ways that we have yet to see you.